so I was pretty harsh on her spark in my original video. I stand by what I said as what I believed, but was I biased by my feelings on how included things were handled or is it as bad as I remember? Obviously I was hooked at some point to make it as far as I did, right? Let's find out and answer the question of, did Transformers or Spark start out well? Well, the episode begins with a spider robot watching two vehicles pull up to what appears to be some kind of rail yard. They claim that they are there to steal a stash from the Autobots, transforming and revealing themselves to be Decepticons. They say the Autobots are working with humans before opening a shipping container to find Energon. This beginning leaves us with a lot of questions. First, who are these cons and what's the state of the Decepticon army if they are scavenging for Energon in a risky place with ties to their enemies? Second, what was the giant spider robot we saw at the beginning? A Decepticon scout that found the Energon, an Autobot scout leading the bots to them, something working with the humans and if so are they the same ones that are allied with the bots or a mysterious third party yet to be revealed? Questions to keep us around in order to find out. As they look at the Energon, vehicles approach them from behind. Most likely the Autobots, given the red and blue color scheme of the truck, you probably already know who it is if you're a Transformers fan, but working under the assumption that you don't, it gets excitement going and keeps tension ramped up. The truck approaches and transforms, revealed to be a Transformer named Optimus, but instead of an Autobot patch, he wears the insignia of a different organization. Now leaving questions for new fans as well as old ones. Who does he work? for and is he an Autobot that was brought up earlier or something far different. The cons say they won't go down without a fight, where right on cue another bot busts out from inside a shipping container and joins Optimus' side, raring for a fight. Optimus trying to solve this peacefully tells the cons that the war is over, and introducing us to their names, Hardtop and Swindle. This means that a war, not sure if it's the one on Cybertron or not, has finally concluded and that the Autobots won, giving us a hint on where we could be on the timeline, Optimus says that he'll give them a peaceful life to where the cons retort. Yeah, in prison! Showing that wherever and however the cons are locked up is anything but peaceful. And when it comes to how this war ended, there is more than meets the eye. The two teams engage in a fight, with a decently choreographed action scene that I praised in my original review and have enough sense to not show much of. I know Hasbro's going to try and bully this video off of YouTube the way it is, so so let's go ahead and move on to how the fight ends. Optimus throws a container at the cons where one pushes the other out of the way, taking the impact to save his life, showing camaraderie between the Decepticons even as they are few in number surviving on their own. It is revealed that Pinky, who has yet to be named, was the one that gave the cons the tip, bringing them into this trap that she seems to have mastermind, making you wonder who she is, what she's capable of, and what she'll do in the future with the intelligence and strategic mind that she showcased today. The remaining Khan says he'll never surrender as he and the bots get jumped by more robot spiders, proving that it's a third party but not who that third party is. As Optimus fights off the spiders and the Khan escapes, the other Khan is revealed to be alive but taken into captivity. Optimus says that the spider tech isn't Cybertronian, with Pinky saying it could be related to rumors of Khans going missing as Optimus says, There's more to this. That meets the eye. He said the thing, he said the thing. We see a convoy drive past the sign into the town of Witwicky and into a title card. Next, we see two kids testing out an invention on the roof, created by the eldest named Robbie, that he uses to get cell phone reception, showing that he has some sort of mechanical, technological, or scientific intelligence that hopefully we see utilized throughout the series. They get a FaceTime from their dad saying that he didn't have foil and it affected dinner, showing us our first attempt at humor since the kids used a foil on their kite. It's not very funny, but it is wholesome at the very least. That being said, if they didn't have internet or service before the kite was put into the sky, then how did the dad know he could FaceTime them, especially since he asks what they were doing and was unaware that they had the foil to begin with, giving no reason for him to have knowledge of what they were up to and the outcome it would cause. A really early writing inconsistency that's not a good sign especially since we're only four minutes in. It's not too big of a deal and can be overlooked, 
but hopefully it's not a hint writing wise of what's to come, given that the entire point of this scene was to establish a connection between the siblings and their technological know-how represented by the invention, and that's undermined by devaluing the invention right after. Also, the signal boost was affected whenever the line was too far out, only getting better when pulled slightly in, which is also completely disregarded since the FaceTime continues to work when the kite is pulled entirely back in to where it would be before they even started, and his phone at that point had no signal, making the scene almost entirely pointless. Its biggest saving grace is that the service does go down eventually, and some of the connection between the characters was shown. It just didn't happen until it was plot convenient, even at the expense of logic-based world building within its universe, and setting a bad precedent of conveniences as well, right at the start. At the dinner table, we see they're a family of four, the dad, mom, son, and daughter. The parents are shown to get along fine, with the dad being known for his goofy and awkward humor as well as his cooking, whereas his wife is shown as well as says that she's a park ranger excited to have this special family time. Time that Robbie, the eldest brother, is spoiling by having his phone at the table, trying to show that the internet works in the house, so that's why the dad felt like he could FaceTime them, but given the fact that he's the first to get mad about phones at the table, as well as him not knowing if they were even in FaceTime range, since without the invention they wouldn't be, it doesn't necessarily solve the original writing issue, but is a respectable step in the right direction. The little girl wins something with her mom, getting food as a prize, as the mother says it isn't fair, leading to Robbie picking at his food and saying that he knows the feeling. The energy of the room drops, tone shifts, showing that he is feeling down and the family is aware of why. Both parents immediately try and cheer him up, saying they'll help him unpack and paint his room, sending him over the edge. He slams the table in a way that would get me smacked if I treated my parents like that, yells that he misses his old room in his old house, that nobody listens to him, that there isn't any Wi-Fi in the house except for that room, also his mom could have her dream job. The writers have yet again ruined the scene from earlier, ripped a band-aid, they put on it off, and gave it another stab in the gut for old time's sake. This time it's a fatality though since the line, Only Wi-Fi is in this room where, guess what? I'm not allowed to use it. Literally means that there was no possible way for the dad to logically call the kids in a way that makes any sense no matter what you try to canonize. If the dining room they are currently in and the kitchen the dad was cooking in is one room, then sure, that's fine. But if he was in that room, then he'd know his kids wasn't. If he was in the kitchen and it's a separate room and he caught them thinking they were in the dining room, then that still doesn't make sense since he wouldn't be able to get the call through. This is a perfect example of why by writing, especially in terms of dialogue, is immensely important to the world and the story you're trying to tell, especially when it first starts out and you're trying to develop new characters. Since this plot hole immediately changes his characterization from Goofy Dad to Goofy Dad that's kinda dumb, since either way he was thinking or lack thereof, the call wasn't able to connect given the circumstances. The dad says that family support each other, that they all made sacrifices to move there in order for the mother to to get her job. This is a fair and respectful point to make. Robbie isn't the only one adjusting to the change and everyone around him is just trying to get through it, including his little sister who he's being an awful example towards. The mother chimes in and states bluntly that they aren't leaving and they'll continue this when he's ready to have a respectful conversation, with her attitude setting Robbie off even more. Although he does need to get it through his head that what's done is done and he was definitely in the wrong when he singled his mother out earlier and disregarded her job and what it means to her and the family as a whole when she realized the dad was handling the situation and that Robbie wasn't getting upset and instead was finally listening, she should have kept her mouth shut or adjusted her tone to match the current situation. This represents her as being stubborn, authoritative, but also lacking in emotional intelligence which is not a good look for people within a position of power, especially those like park rangers that have to deal with the public in and out of emergencies. Robbie goes upstairs and slams his door. Another thing I'd be in trouble for, so the daughter says she should probably try to go talk to him, taking food to break the ice and making the parents proud in the process in a pretty sweet scene. When she gets up to his room, she makes a wholesome joke. She didn't 
didn't know this house comes with free room service. And realizes Robbie has ran away, leaving out of his window. I can make the joke again, but it's becoming too obvious now. Just like how obvious it would be if you ran away after basically challenging someone to walk up to your room after you. Riding their bikes on whatever side of the road they want, Mo chases down Robbie who says he's going back to his real home in Philly. Given we don't know what his age is and we do know how kids' minds work, especially when they're stressed, I can see him as thinking that this is not only something he could do, but given his interaction with his parents probably feeling like talking to a wall due to the word choices used by his mom, he probably feels like he has no choice but to leave as well. The girl's chain on her bike breaks, causing Robbie to go back for her, saying he'll fix her bike then she can go home, showing that regardless of how mad he is and what his go may be, he cares for his little sister above it all. Vehicles head towards the kids with us learning the girl's name for what I believe is the first time, with it being Mo. The kids try to run out of the path of the vehicles that show no sign of slowing down, mind you, but get stopped by the spiders from the beginning who ignore the kids to shoot missiles at the convoy, blowing it up and sending the kids jumping over the edge of the bridge. This scene establishes a few things. First, that the convoy and the spiders are enemies. Second, that the spiders seem to not have much autonomy or anything resembling real intelligence given they had no reaction whatsoever to the presence of the kids. Third, that the convoy may not have cared for the lives of the kids either given they never even attempted to stop, which could be explained by them being in the dark and hard to see, but with all those vehicles that is unlikely even if it is possible. The kids slam off the ground, roll down a hill, and slam off the ground again. They are playing the finals however because they take no fall damage, brush it off, and move on. This hurts the show in terms of establishing a foundation of stakes. If the kids can survive that without even a scratch, what's the scale of danger after to be for them to even be in it. This can be applied to every character since the kids are arguably the most vulnerable and yet show that level of durability. That idea also needs taken into account when considering that question, as it's left in the air by how this scene is portrayed and it's going to make it harder to answer the further the show goes on while avoiding it. This is when the scene that I referenced in my earlier video happens, when the kids go from 0 to 100, fight about things that were never hinted at in a very very contrived way. Let's talk about it. Robbie asks if Mo is okay with genuine concern in his voice as he says they should get her back to the house. So far, so good. It's showing his love for his sister and willingness to put her before himself, which has already been established. Helping lay a foundation for his character as a caring and intelligent older brother and although being emotionally charged towards his parents for their decisions, he doesn't take it out on her since she had no say. Now let's take everything I just said about his character and tear it apart in order to throw some more character drama into the mix. What do I mean? Well, just listen. Does this mean you're staying now? Here with me and mom and dad? Stop doing that. Doing what? <sighs> Trying to control my life! What's wrong with you, Robbie? The big brother I know would never go on an adventure without me. He disappeared when we left the city. There's nothing here worth staying for. Not even me? Well, you're... That's not... I don't... Now I can tear this apart line by line, but if you felt the whiplash from how he's portrayed, how they are both portrayed, and how that conversation turned out, then we're in the same boat. Robbie immediately accuses Mo, someone who is younger than him, someone he has showed protective traits over, someone he puts before himself as controlling his life. Mo, who has been shown as supportive of him, who was the one to come after him, who has put him above herself, responds by literally shoving him. This aggression from either side side toward either side was never built up at all. There was not a single hint, a single moment that would justify either outburst. Then when the writers seemed to have no idea on how to actually end the argument, they had them scream at each other, even though it doesn't relate to the conversation they were having at all. Just another convenient way to jump from one plot point to the next without any smooth transitioning or threads tying it together. Also hurting the foundation laid for the characters, as they 
they did with the parents earlier while they are at it. Now we are 8 minutes in and yet right back to where we started in terms of developing the characters and the dynamic between them. The only consistent thing is that Robbie is smart in some regard and can repair and build things. Something that at this rate I'm afraid that they'll forget about as well but I guess we'll see. The duo see a light coming from a cave, curiosity hits and they decide to approach. Them dropping the argument and moving on isn't unusual for kids depending on the ages since they are quicker to forgive than the majority of adults. That applies even more to siblings that usually look out for each other and get along such as these two apparently do. Again the writing has made it a bit more of a question than it should be and as much as I could argue that that is another issue, it's also just as possible for it to actually play out this way so I'll give them a point. That being said it does kind of make the whole scene we just saw kind of pointless if they never touch on it again. Especially the part where Robbie implied that Mo wasn't worth sticking around for. That obviously hurt her feelings and if there isn't some semblance of consequences for that, it's a big missed opportunity and does bring continuity in terms of consequences into question. The duo walk into a cave, Mo picks up a rock ready for trouble. She throws it on the ground, cracking it, leading to a rather genius line actually. Take it easy, John Henry. Short history lesson here, John Henry hammered or drove steel drills into rock in order to make spots for explosives to be placed. Her breaking the rock off the ground with a rock was a pretty solid reference to that. It also foreshadowed the next scene where the ground breaks beneath them as if it explodes, sending them falling deeper into the tunnel. Just as what was established last time they fell, a couple in show minutes ago actually, they didn't get injured here either. In fact, Robbie feels so good that he can hop from stone to stone, avoiding the liquid beneath over to some kind of crystal. Here we get another joke from Mo. It kind of lands too, although it does drag on a bit too long for my humor. That's how scary movies start. It could be a mutant lightning bug egg. Or turn your hand into goo. Or maybe it's the cursed eyeball of a dinosaur <laughs> god. That being said, it was a wholesome moment, especially with Robbie's smile at the end as he's enjoying this adventure with his sister whether he wants to admit it or not. Robbie touches the crystal, knocking it over, and as Mo jokes that he broke it, he immediately yells that he didn't. This small little interaction feels a little more reasonable than the last, but also makes Robbie look like the younger of the two siblings due to the very immature reaction, the same reaction that conflicts with his argument at the table, however, since there his frustration was due to the situation out of his control that felt very unfair to him and he stated his points well without getting defensive until his mother said what she said that is. Even then he didn't argue and instead ran away from the conflict. Here though he's quick to get defensive and yell just like he was outside of the cave at random. If he isn't like that towards something that is important and meaningful to him, you'd think he'd have the self control to keep himself collected over a simple joke. His emotional maturity isn't clearly defined, causing him to switch up whenever necessary and feel like a way to push the plot forward by reacting based on how he needs to in that moment instead of how he actually would as a person. Robbie isn't strong enough to pick the stone up on his own, even though he toppled it over with ease, only needing a simple tap. Due to gravity and the apparent weight of the crystal, we can just say that it was already leaning a little bit and leave it as that for the sake of letting the show go on, but hopefully this is a day hint of poorly defined physics within the show in the future. Robbie and Mo together pick up the crystal, with the CGI not able to showcase the struggle that their grunts portray them to have, which is just an artistic nitpick for me and not actually a demerit regarding the show itself, given that TF Prime and 2012 TMNT was both CG and able to use facial animations as well as body form to showcase the struggle that they would have picking something up and this modern show does not, is an example of industry issues as a whole, especially compared to mediums like anime, but I'll save that for another time. The two set the crystal upon a rock as it starts to glow, mutter words, and trap the kids' hands inside. Once they pull them out, they have a glove formed on their hands, and what appears to be transformers are created. The kids ask what they are as the two groups scare each other with the bots hiding behind a rock. The kids and bots are linked, with them experiencing each other's feelings and knowing their names through a link established by the glove. Mo approaches the bots first, with Robbie following behind. The bots use the link
Link to determine that the kids are human and that they are friends. This opens the door for what the Link actually transmits. If it's thoughts and that's how they learn the species of the humans right off the bat, or just feelings and there is another writing issue with them being able to determine the identity of another race on first contact directly after what is essentially their birth. Robbie and the more feminine bot, given that appearance I'll assume it's Twitch, decide simultaneously to walk up to one another and touch hands, like Hiccup putting out his hand for Toothless in order to establish trust. This opens the door for questioning whether the bots are specifically linked to the kids, one for one, as a partnership, or if they both have the same link to both bots simultaneously. For example, Robbie feeling the feelings of both Twitch and Thrash instead of one or the other. A spider bot then randomly attacks, causing the one that I assume is Thrash to react by immediately defending the kids, whereas Twitch reacts by shooting the bot before she even realizes what she's doing. Showing the protective nature of the bots, whether it's acting as a shield as was the case for Thrash, or acting as a blade as was the case for Twitch, they both took the initiative to save the kids they are connected with, immediately showcasing the bond that they share and opening the doors for its development. Although the conflict here did actually help showcase the characters, the bond, and the power they wield, it wasn't without its flaws. The spiders up to this point didn't seem autonomous, they didn't travel alone, and they didn't attack without cause as shown when the kids were ignored when they were on the bridge. This scene changes things with the spider being alone, attacking the moment it sees the group, immediately perceiving them as threats even though there was no prior contact with them. So either this bot was a straggler for no apparent reason, is autonomous and decided to attack because of it, or the person controlling them decided to disregard their earlier experiences with Optimus in the convoy to completely change tactics in the most futile and plot convenient way. We then see a man watch the feed from the bot and see what happened. He asks the Transformers that the Autobots captured, the one that the spiders apparently kidnapped from the convoy, if they are his friends to which he says no. The man takes off the con's arm in a seemingly painless procedure, which again hurts the stakes as well as the idea of consequence since this homie doesn't react to his arm being lobbed off, stating that the con will help him gain power and that he has no affiliation with the Autobots. Robbie and Mo sneak the bots to the barn at their house and discuss how they can't tell their parents as Robbie says they are just kids and this amount of responsibility over two Earthborn Transformers would probably get them taken away. This shows the Robbie we saw at the dinner table, immature and afraid sure, but able to articulate the reasons why in a more mature way. It feels like an entirely different person than the one randomly screaming from earlier. Robbie and Mo tell the boss that they have to stay hidden, causing the boss to feel sad and ask as well as insinuate that the kids don't want to be with them. Now the connection between them isn't defined at all. Given that facts about the kids were transmitted earlier, making it so assumptions weren't needed since feelings, names, species, and who knows what else was shared between them. Now that apparently doesn't apply in the same way. Only feelings alone are transmitted, retconning the previous scene right into the next. Something this show has done in spades. They should have just naturally introduced themselves, stating hey I'm a human in the process, as well as what a human is. Sure it'd take a couple extra seconds, but it would have solidified how the connection works instead of making it into something that changes as situations needed to. Robbie gets another good argument complimenting the last, as well as the one at the dinner, hopefully having his character stick to this pattern of characterization from now on so we can finally have a solid foundation. He says that he was about to leave the town for good before they stumbled onto the bots, that now he has a reason to stick around, causing Mo to punch him in the arm referencing the conversation earlier I wish they'd move on from. Since they didn't however, let's talk about how that affects things. Now that the conversation has been used as an example of how continuity works within the show, and how the line impacts Mo has been brought into perspective twice, the fact that Robbie made the same mistake twice needs to now be addressed in a more serious manner. It makes it out as if there are unresolved issues between them and him disregarding her as a reason to stay is more than just a Freudian slip. Definitely not something they should have doubled down on within the same episode, especially since the characters as individuals are still being defined. The kids say if they wait till tomorrow, they'll find a way to clear the situation up with their parents, and the bots, sensing hope, decides to trust them. Mo gives them comics about Transformers and the kids leave for the night. The next morning, the parents are enjoying the calm remote place they now live compared to the bustling stress of the city. Mo wakes up Robbie, where we can now see what the entire glove looks like as it being more of a sleeve than anything else, even putting the Kaijudo gauntlets to shame in terms of size. It is established here that Robbie Robbie usually sleeps in late, and that the bots have been studying Cybertronian history books as well as the comics that were given that could hold 
hold the same effect. This really terrible joke happens where tra- <laughs> trash. This really terrible joke happens where Trash says that Transformers are bananas, and Twitch replies by saying there were vehicles in the issue that she read. Yeah, that's the height of humor in this series so far. Then the kids decide to play hide and seek in order to get the bots out of sight, even though it was established last scene that they would listen if told the truth of the situation. You know, when they were literally told to stay in the barn out of sight. Then hide and seek happens, then Thrash picks a new game. It's pretty annoying and it doesn't add anything until Thrash Thrash falls out of a tree and the giant metal robot is the first to take fall damage in the show. The stakes in the show are so poorly defined that I could have an aneurysm. Twitch then tries to transform into a minivan, thinking she already has, which I will admit was kinda funny. Then she gets the alarm going off and they get dragged back into the barn. The kids decide to have a picnic with their dad so he can explain the history of Cybertron in an area where the bots can overhear. Although his goofiness does make him a fairly unreliable narrator, Raider, to try and counteract that point, the dad literally says that history is the way to his heart, so it's established that he cares enough about it that he should get it right. A fairly good way to establish that even if it is a little last minute. Props for seeing the issue in his characterization and coming up with a way to counteract it. He says that, On September 17th, 1984, everything on Earth changed. The original Transformers series was released in September 27, 1984. Food for thought as we continue with his story. He talks about the war on Cybertron, Autobots versus Decepticons, with his favorite being Bumblebee. Then on Earth, the Transformers and Spike joined forces with the mom and the kids apparently because, why not, to take on the Decepticons. Optimus destroyed the space bridge that could get them back to Cybertron, making all of them stuck on Earth. That action apparently caused caused Megatron to immediately switch sides and determine that Optimus has a point. Then the war was over. Yep, that's the story. Using elements of the original series from the time period to the designs and the war, changing the way they got to Earth so they could trap them there with as little writing effort as possible. Even though they could literally just build a new bridge or build a spaceship or figure out a new form of transportation entirely. But let's not think about that since it hurts the plot it's trying to establish. He also says Bumblebee has been missing ever since, possibly representing his death or eventual return as Goldbug, but I guess we'll see. The bots get confused, not feeling like Transformers or part of their story, wanting to learn about Earth, where they were born instead. The mom arrives where the battle took place on the bridge, seeing the exploded vehicles and setting up cones to block it off as the Autobots arrive. Optimus messed up the cones and tries to fix it, with Pinky having to apologize for him as he continues to complain. He refers to the mom, who will learn from Pinky's name is Dot, as Lieutenant, getting her fired up since she's a forest ranger now and wants nothing to do with the Autobots. The bots tell her they work with Ghost, and now that I can see them up close, they still harbor the Autobot in Cygna, so although it's different, I apologize for getting that wrong at the beginning. That's all me. She also gets informed that Ghost made her job, tricking her to move to her location, the location of Ghost HQ. This is actually a good revelation that helps the story out well. Given her being established to have history, it makes sense that they want her back in the fold. The arrival of the new threat who controls the spiders and dismembers cons is also also a fair setup for them needing unofficial help. The mom's job not being what she was excited about, what she uprooted her family for, further exemplifies the conversation at dinner from the beginning of the episode when the dad said they all made sacrifices and Robbie unfairly blamed the entire situation on his mother as if she is being selfish for doing what she wants. Dot then realizes it's all a lie, but her reaction was a bit underwhelming. She isn't angry, feeling used, nothing of that caliber. She lets Optimus explain the situation and then switches the conversation to talking about that, completely disregarding her own feelings on the matter in a very unbelievable way. It also goes against her characterization, given how she responds to Robbie in terms of him complaining about her job and the effect it had on him, yet here she shrugs it off like it's no big deal at all. This Optimus is rather cold, manipulative, and uncaring so far. He shows no concern for the missing con, even while at the scene of the 
ambush, shows no care for the manipulation of Dot, instead justifying it like the ends outweighs the means. And even him complaining about his day, knowing he is making another person stay worse, makes him really hard to get behind in our second scene with a minute. Also, just as I stated in my first video, I still hate his design, and Justice League Superman vs. STAS Superman is still the best comparison. He tells her that they need her due to the spider threat and a newcomer arrives. This is a pretty banger intro for Megatron, as he picks Dot up and they act far more familiar than she did with Optimus. She says that working with him would make the job not all bad, but scowls at Optimus. This Megatron is not like any other incarnation ever. It's impossible to believe he was ever a threat when you see him here, and he exhibits no traits of the Decepticon leader that the story earlier said that he was. He's a kind-hearted gentle giant, and given we weren't actually shown a real reason of why he joined his enemies besides that he believed they had a point, it makes this feel like a whole new character only named Megatron for recognition alone. Optimus sends drones out to scout the area that he gets from his trailer, which is a cool scene that opens the door to question what else he may have and what use it could be. Robbie and Twitch are hanging out in the woods, naming birds, literally. This scene is also kind of funny, all things considered. Robbie says they should compete for target practice, but Twitch can't seem to get her laser to work until Robbie gets the idea to surprise her by throwing a rock her direction. This builds on the characterization of Robbie that I'm on board with. Him being intelligent, thinking just as he did here. The first time Twitch used her blaster was when they were in danger. Remembering that he triggers her reflexes and in turn her weapon by weaponizing a rock against her. Surprising her enough that she identifies it as a threat and eliminates it. She then gets excited saying that she's the best, further showcasing her optimistic demeanor. Thrash is juggling rocks as well as Mo till she gets caught in the tree laughing it off as a rock slams Thrash in the face. Homie's gotten injured almost every scene he's been in, poor guy. He says that she's not sad anymore, taking Mo by surprise, since she didn't equate how she felt with sadness till now. Thrash says he could feel the sadness affecting her in everything she did, showing a certain level of emotional maturity, especially for someone just born. Mo finally opens up about how the move affected her, a scene that was foreshadowed by the dad saying they all sacrificed something, and one that they handled rather well. She says the move has been hard, not being specific on why, but just saying that now she wants everyone to be happy, which is something she has showcased throughout the episode, besides in that argument scene earlier that we already established that I hate. This is one of the reasons why. Thrash, in an attempt to cheer her up, says her family probably wants her happy as well, so her allowing herself to be that way may make them happy too. Another rather mature response, understanding Mo well in a rather wholesome way. Twitch sees one of the drones, climbs a tree, and unwillingly scans it, falling out of the tree and activating her vehicle mode. This is also a good scene, actually, with her transforming when in danger, just like how she learned to shoot earlier. She is governed by jokes and reflexes, with a body that wants her to survive, reacting in the best way to ensure it. Robbie gets excited that Twitch transformed and obtained a vehicle mode, as the drone scans him before getting shot down by Twitch. The drone was interested and specifically scanning his cyber sleeve, so maybe Optimus or Ghost as an agency know more about it than it seems. Mo and Thrash show up, with Thrash not wanting a vehicle mode of his own after seeing Twitches. He tried to scan a squirrel, doesn't work, so they go into town as Robbie tries to fix the drone. Optimus recalls his drones, they see one is missing, and we learn they were made by Wheeljack, setting up the question of who he is for new TF fans and giving the old ones a reason to get hyped for when we eventually get to see him. Megatron tells Dot he's glad to see her, referring to her by her full first name, Dorothy. He spends this scene hyping up Optimus, saying he changed sides due to a change of heart. It's a good speech, but not very engaging, and doesn't add anything to his character nor his backstory that we don't already know. Optimus says the Jones found nothing, so they need to search the town itself, and then he finally says his signature line, Autobots, roll out! Leaving a decent joke from Megatron about him not knowing if that means him. Get it? Because he was a Decepticon? Yeah, it was funnier the first time, but this scene added nothing when breaking it down, besides a way for the Autobots to probably run into Twitch and Thrash. We then see the Spider-Man talking to Hardtop, getting Hardtop's arm attached to his body, threatening his brother, who I'm guessing is the con we saw with him at the beginning, Swindle. Establishing a reason for the sacrifice that occurred there, as well as by adding details to the relationship between them. Metal Arm then checks details from the destroyed Spider-Bot 
from earlier and sends his bots to Witwicky in order to hunt. They are going in hordes again how they are meant to operate with no reason given for the loner from earlier. Nice. Mo and Thrash are on a rooftop looking for a vehicle mode and the importance it has. This leads Mo into talking about her bike that got destroyed in the beginning and why it meant a lot to her. Possibly influencing Thrash's op mode when he finds one where speed and style will be important if that's the route he takes. A spider bot attacks with Thrash standing there and letting himself get trashed where he then gets saved by Mo. The guy's been a joke this entire episode in terms of getting himself beat up. Reminds me of New Age Squidward and it's starting to worry me. Robbie is riding Twitch through the woods. I guess we just abandoned the entire fix the drone idea and are now pretending like it never happened. I love how many times this episode has had pointless scenes that either add nothing or actively hurt things. It's not even worth pointing out in breakdown terms anymore, it's just disappointing. Twitch break checks sending Robbie flying off at high speeds from a high altitude, but since he isn't Thrash, he's perfectly fine. They both get a feeling through their plot connection that Mo and Thrash need help and decide to go check it out. Robbie sees a drone he was currently working on when the last scene ended, but it's broken and not worked on now, but music hints that it'll be important so maybe this time they'll actually use it. If they didn't show him working on it earlier to then come back to it in the same state it was already in and him fooling around, they would have came to the same outcome at this scene and not wasted our time and dragged down the pacing with the earlier one. What a drag. The spider goes to attack Mo again, but Thrash steps in to try and save her, but since he can't fight worth a darn unless he learns Takjutsu, the spider is only defeated when Twitch and Robbie shows up and shoots it. Robbie got it with the drone, so at least it got some screen time. I'm glad we can see Thrash try to protect her, but the fact that he isn't able to take out a single spider bot is honestly not a good look for a new hero. Especially when Optimus swatted them like flies, Twitch destroyed it in one shot, and now a literal child took one out. What a way to hype up your new Transformers. Glad they are so useful. Anyway, more spider bots come and the drone is snatched. Oh no, not the drone we hyped up for two scenes that said the same thing but burn time so we can have a 44 minute special? Anything but that. With the kids surrounded it looks like Trash will finally have the chance to shine with Mo literally telling him that but because this show doesn't like him, he gets saved by Pinky and Optimus before he gets a single lick in. We get another scene with a lone spider bot existing just to die and make the heroes look good, so then the normal and sensible strategy of a swarm can happen to add tension that's then resolved quickly. The same strategy that was employed at the beginning when one spider jumps on the cons before more come, then deployed in reverse with the army first and then the lone one, now we're back to the original and coming full circle. The show fails to add any creativity to the encounters at hand, relying on the same writing formulas in order to generate conflict, but falling flat once you realize the very obvious pattern. They could have had two spider bots, scouts, and employee tension since they need to be destroyed before they can report back. They could have had the spiders slowly get into position as the heroes talked, surrounding them out of sight of the bots but inside of us, building tension every moment before they attack. They could have swarmed from multiple areas all at once, without warning, surrounding the heroes before they can even register what's happening. The heroes could fight the spiders, take out a few before the drone gets disabled, the group is separated or exhausted, and then at the last moment, the others arrive to help. I could go on for hours regarding ways they could have switched just this last scene in a way that makes the third threat, the one the ghost needed dot for so badly, an actual threat. Instead, they are treated as a joke and less has been learned about either side in now 30 minutes than what we learned in 20 minutes during my Ben 10 video. I'm flabbergasted by how little we've actually progressed the plot, developed the players within it, and laid a foundation for the future. The two groups finally meet with Dot as mad as she is, immediately embracing her kids and saying that if she wasn't so glad to see them safe then she'd be furious, showing the caring, loving mama bear side that hasn't had time to shine until now, hopefully repairing the bad blood between her and Robbie, especially with the new revelations involving her job and his connection to it. Sure, it may feel like a rushed reconciliation, but it will serve to show better in the long run given the writing prowess that has been on display so far. Optimus says he'll contact Ghost and get the bots transported away, another example of a cold, uncaring Optimus Prime that he has been the entire episode, which is the antithesis of who Optimus should be and the symbol that he is. Robbie rightfully calls him out, telling him that the bots have names, Twitch and Thrash, and that they should stay with him. With the response from Optimus being an emotionalist, Excuse me? 
gave the man a face but not matching his expressions to his tone and his tone to his words is making everything he says seem detached. Megatron questions where Twitch and Thrash are from, getting interrupted by the beeping of a ghost transport that is pointed out to be unusually quick. Optimus, without acknowledging anything that Robbie said, further emphasizing his uncaring and authoritative nature, tells Double T that is their ride, leading them to say they don't want to go anywhere without the kids, with Robbie standing firm and saying they won't, still having Robbie stay in character with the scenes that I like, which is good. Mo pleads with her mother, trying to appeal to her, but when it doesn't work, Robbie jumps in with the aggression. That makes sense for his character at this point, since this is the second time he's felt like his mother didn't understand. Again, good moments are starting to appear, which I am thankful for. The mom promises that the kids can see them later, and then Twitch and Thrash load into the vehicle and it drives away, revealing Edward Elric driving the vehicle which was set up by the line commenting on the arrival time which again was a nice touch. How he knows that they caught in for the vehicle isn't explained though. They could have used the Spiderbot spying, have the captured drone be reprogrammed by its capture earlier and watching, yada yada yada, headcanon it yourselves and let's move on. Optimus and Pinky are talking to fans and press, so much for robots in disguise, which makes zero sense given Transformers are literally being attacked and kidnapped by an unknown third party, but who cares about logical consistencies and intelligent strategies? Certainly not the writers, given they would put something like that that's entirely unnecessary in the background. How goofy. The kids update the parents on what happened, recap, the parents say they should have told them immediately about their newfound friends, and can always talk to them about anything. The dad giving out juice boxes here was a good touch though. Robbie reiterates what he said the entire episode, that the parents wouldn't listen because they never do. He shares his feelings logically, bringing up how nobody asked him and Mo if they wanted to move, then when they made friends, didn't care about how it would make them feel to watch them get taken away. The mom actually lets him speak his feelings, since his tone isn't rife with attitude, a callback to the respectful conversation line from the dinner and yet again another good touch. Mo brings up that the kids aren't the only ones keeping secrets, since it's now revealed to them that mom is back to working with the Transformers, as well as the new organization, Ghost, something the dad didn't know about either. She tells them Ghost is her new boss and she'll be working with the Autobots. The kids explain their connection to the young bots as Optimus says Ghost has no record of the truck or the driver and that they are missing before ensuring the kids that they will be found, with the mom vowing to help in order to keep her promise. A callback to earlier when Mo said that mom always keeps her promises, showing Dot to be an honest person with some integrity that may be expanded upon in the future. Next up, we see Nagato bringing Twitch and Thrash into base telling them to sit down and manipulating them by having the spider bots do tricks in order to earn their trust. It's goofy that it's all that it takes, but given that these bots were just born, I'll give them a pass for not seeing the dark side of humanity and not having a grasp of human nature. After all, they've only encountered kind humans up to this point. Guts calls the bots Terran since they were born on Earth, finally getting himself a name in the process. From Thrash, Cod Mandroid. He gets triggered about his new name, showing him to have some anger anger issues, but controls himself enough to ask where the cave is in which the bots were born. The kids feel the Terran's emotions and are tracking them from it. This ability was kinda hinted at by how quickly Robbie and Twitch found Mo and Thrash, but now it's confirmed. I could make guesses on how it may be utilized in the future, if at all, but the whole feeling connection so far has just been a plot pusher that I don't feel like wasting any more time on. Dorothy texts Optimus and Megatron their coordinates, where we get a scene of actual text messages and Optimus using emojis. It's silly, but honestly, I kinda like it. Even if it doesn't necessarily make much sense, it adds a layer to their dynamic, shows a softer side of Optimus, and doesn't really harm anything in the process. I don't feel like it's out of character for Optimus, especially since people text differently than they talk in real life, so no complaints here unless it never happens again. Megatron calls them and says the robot emoji gets him every time while laughing. Wholesome, sure, but again, nothing he said has actually hinted at him possibly having a past as a tyrannical Decepticon. Plus, it doesn't add much as a scene, so although I like it in isolation, it did mess with the pacing as well as was strange since he called just to say that and remind you, the audience, of these old times that keep getting referenced in case you forgot every other interaction they had this episode where they did the same thing. Mandroid says he and the Terrans are alike, both different than everyone else, so not accepted by
by them. Then the Terrans try to leave since they feel the kids coming closer, but get pushed back into the chair and locked in. The biggest thing I want to talk about here is that this machine has a Decepticon logo on it, which was a strange decision making you wonder how he got it, why the cons had it, if this was a con's base, if he worked with or is working with some Decepticons, you get the idea. Truthfully, it could be nothing given it's a blink and you'll miss it scene, but if they took the time to add it, then it should have some significance. A machine comes down to do something to them, but is interrupted by an explosion. Optimus, Megs, and Dada assaulting the fortress. Optimus tells Mandroid to stand down. As Mandroid asks if they are Robbie and Moe, which was admittedly a little funny given it's referencing a one-off line that Thrash gave before being strapped to the chair. Mandroid sends the spider bots after them. Megatron destroys a ton, saying that resistance is his favorite part. Possibly, finally, a hint of who he used to be that comes out during combat, or maybe the writers just thought it sounded cool. Either way, it can work as a glimpse of the old him, so intentional or not, I'll give them props for it. It's something his character desperately needed. A good action scene happened, showing Megs, Prime, and Dodd able to hold their own, with Dodd actually able to contribute and use her small size to her advantage. There are references to past battles with Dodd and Megatron, but they've hammered this history home enough that I'm not even going to waste time on it. Dodd destroying the machine and setting the Terrans free, again showing her intelligence as well as combat prowess. She also calls them kids, which was pretty sweet. Also a reference to Robbie calling the Terrans family earlier when advocating for them to not be sent away. Pinky, gosh I wish they just call her Elite One but oh well, crashes through the ceiling too but got entangled in a fight against Decepticons and Mandroid was able to escape. I'm skipping around a bit since nothing of merit is happening, hard to break down a bunch of senseless fighting, sorry about that. Her and Cons fight outside, the dad finally says her name and the names of some Decepticons as the vehicle gets attacked by a con named Skullcrusher but saved by the Terrans. With his arm working like an action figure for a second which was a neat touch but ultimately causing Thrash to yet again be blasted and sent flying. Oh joy. At least he gets his vehicle form inspired by Moe's bike and the qualities it had as set up earlier which I could have given a credit as a good scene if they didn't use Thrash as a punching bag for the umpteenth time just to get there. Always using the same old tricks in this show I swear. Thrash trips Skullcrusher which is apparently enough to take him down for a moment before transforming and revealing a pretty snazzy robot mode and doing his victory dance he's done other times in this episode that was taught to him by Mo. The Terrans start to fight Skullcrusher again, leaving the dad defenseless to an Insecticon attack. Before he can get on alive though, he's saved by Bumblebee, who makes him an honorary Autobot before making short work of the con like it's child's play. In a pretty good introductory scene that establishes his fighting prowess as well as his kind heart. Everyone's joined together with the cons all rounded up and Hardtop revealing that he didn't know what came over him and that he'd never fight Megatron willingly, possibly hinting at some sort of mind control that was used on him. Optimus reveals that Bumblebee wasn't hiding as B is itching for another fight but has a new task in training the Terrans. Dot advocates that the Terrans stay with her, they're bonded to her kids and part of the family, showing that she listened earlier to their grievances and is working to make things right. A good scene that not only showcases the mother's love but also demonstrates her strength and the respect the bots have for her. Optimus says he hoped she'd say that, that the Terrans deserve to know about both their worlds and can stay with her. This is a sweet scene but there hasn't been much development from Prime before this point to make it feel earned. Up till now he was entirely by the book and although the outcome could have been the same, there should have been some resistance first. Take Batman and Superman's first encounter for example in the DCAU. They both have reservations towards how the other handles their crime fighting duty. Superman gets overwhelmed however but saved by Batman, causing them to garner some respect towards one another. There's more to it obviously, but I'm not covering that episode so I'm trying to keep it brief. Here they could have had multiple moments throughout, where instead of glances of disgust, Dot actually challenges him and how he's running his ship. Then here in this scene he could say that he's taking the Terrans back. Dot could yet again stand against him with more fire than before due to the personal ties to it and since she released the Terran she'd have respectable actions that we saw on screen to back her up. Just like Batman isn't a super powered hero, she's not a transformer, yet she proves her ability to stand beside them as equals. This episode ends with the newfound family bonding, with Thrash and the dad cooking, Moe and Robbie playing basketball with Twitch, and B and Dot coming back from 
work. The parents kiss to solidify their relationship as the kids go get the foil they were supposed to bring earlier, another nod at trying to represent continuity in an episode that has really messed it up. The Terrence and kids are on the roof where the kids alone started the episode, now thankful to live where they live, with the reason why represented by the Terrence being the only difference in the two scenes. So did Transformers Earth Spark start out well? I hate to say it, but no. No it didn't. Not at all. It doesn't make the first episode horrible trash or anything, but it's far from good, almost average, almost. The first half of the episode, also referred to as Episode 1, is a complete mess. The foundation of characters is laid, dug back up, and laid again. Dialogue can go from sensible for the characters to straight out of left field when compared to how they were characterized up to and past that point. The family dynamic between the Maltos is a strained one, giving us something to look forward to seeing repaired, but since we didn't see them getting along before that point, we don't really have an idea of what reparations would look like. The same formula is used to initiate conflict whether it's physical or if it's verbal. The humans getting angry at one another and it escalating and then something happens to keep it from being resolved. Robbie walks away, cave starts to shine, the crystal starts to form. The verbal conflicts normally don't have a concluded outcome and instead just stop. Which aside from Robbie storming off, which does seem reasonable, the rest of the time it just feels like they didn't know how to end it since the conflicts didn't even have to happen to begin with and just fill time to extend the length of the episode. The physical confrontations I already went over, following the same formula of a lone spider, a lone spider loses, many spiders, many spiders lose, with a variation in regards to order but the idea remaining the same. There were no scouts, no strategy employed, and nothing to differentiate the battles and up the stakes until the addition of the Insecticons and Decepticons during the final fight, where at this point in the show things start to improve and raising the stakes here was a good idea. I'm not dissing the final fight in regards to formula, because they do attempt to improve from it and deserve some credit for that. The Autobots backstory was told in a simple flashback, but how that translates to who they are now is never touched on. Why would the Decepticon leader switch sides? Oh, but Trevor, they say Optimus's ways convinced him. Yes, but what ways were those? Why did it take him so long to be convinced if Optimus held the same values the entire war? Why would no other cons, due to their loyalty being towards Megs himself and not the cause, follow their leader whenever he switched sides? Does Megatron not have to pay for his crime since he swapped up? And if that's the case, then wouldn't it make sense for others to do the same? The list goes on. None of it is answered, it isn't even touched upon, forcing us to accept it and move on by minimizing the gravity of the situation and the importance of convincing the leader of the cons to join your side. It would have made much more sense to have Meg stay the leader of the cons, accept a non-aggression treaty, and having the cons fall in line to follow the will of the master they followed all this time. I came up with that within mere seconds and it doesn't fundamentally change the character of Megatron in order for it to happen. When it comes down to the rest of the Transformers, including the Terrans, there isn't much to say. They have Optimus feeling disconnected from the rest, showing little emotion until the end. How he is, what could be an act, what could be real, we don't spend enough time with him to get a concrete tell of who his character is, but he doesn't quite feel like Optimus, that's for sure. It can be argued that in Transformers Prime he felt emotionless as well, and although I can bring up a million examples to counter it, freezing with RC, sacrificing himself when the raid comes from the Decepticon Cynodel, offering to bring Raph back Snow from the Arctic since he's never seen it before. Seeing the flaws of the team as strengths instead of weaknesses, like when he said Bulkhead may be too large for this world but his inner strength knows no bounds. Him getting to know and understand the kids. Him giving Wheeljack a chance how he is instead of trying to change him like Ultra Magnuso originally does. The scene with Fowler in the recap episode at the military base after Nemesis Prime. Him prioritizing Earth even above Cybertron which is something that we are told Earth Spark off Optimus does, but never get to see that human caring side of him until the end with Dot, etc. Oh, but Trevor, this is the first episode. And Darkness Rising was considered the first episode of Transformers Prime, and my point is shown there as well. Prime telling Ratchet to retreat, taking the kids in concern for their safety, mourning the loss of Cliffjumper, being there for RC during that loss, but taking Ratchet's words to heart as well as valuing the thoughts and feelings of the whole team. Willing to kill Megatron to save Earth, even 
even if it risks their chance to save Cybertron and goes against his want to save his brother that he used to have, referring to Megatron himself. Verbally defending Fowler against the others when he isn't around, I think my point has been made. His characterization was established early on, through both actions as well as words. Whether you love it or hate it, that doesn't change that. Alita can fight and come up with strategies, okay cool, but who is she? Bumblebee has been in hiding but is now a trainer for the Terrans moving forward, okay cool, but who is he? Usually Optimus's word when making him the teacher would be enough, but we already established why that doesn't hold any weight right now, so it's hard to really care. The Terrans are fine. Twitch is energetic, smart, and capable in combat. Thrash is emotionally intelligent at times, but reduced to a punching bag whenever the plot needs someone to be. He was wasted potential and hopefully isn't utilized as a plot pusher moving forward now that he has had a successful combat encounter and got a vehicle mode at the very end. Wheeljack exists in this universe and builds things. Cool, why doesn't he build a space bridge? Who knows? Again, there is nothing to really help us build a connection with any of them. They aren't clearly defined as characters who we could see making decisions for themselves outside of what we see on the show. Everything that happened to them was dependent on the plot itself. They were built around the situation instead of in order to react to it and respond to said situations. Ghost exists. Mysterious, sure, but they aren't really established to do anything suspicious. They work with the Autobots and that's about all we know. The biggest hints of things not being as they seem is probably the cons in Lockup Line, but given that they are Decepticons and that it's coming from Decepticons, it makes sense for them to be there. Then there's the manipulation of Dot, but given she's worked with the Autobots before Ghost was founded, it's hard to say whose idea that actually was. Ghost shouldn't have been introduced as well as their manipulation of of Dot until a few more episodes in. Given time for them to establish themselves, lay a foundation of hints, and give the audience time to adjust to things instead of speed running plot twists and hurting their significance in the process. The kids are better by the end, and if they kept characterization consistent from now on, with changes due to experience and growth instead of pointless runtime extending bickering, then they could be decent characters that we see grow as the show goes on. I don't remember it going that way however, but hey, fresh start, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm currently working on covering Naruto as well, which is doing a far better job with their young characters on practically every front. The first episode being half the time limit of this one, established Naruto's character, his drive to grow as a person, the stakes represented by the lengths he's willing to go, his relationship with the rest of the village, his father figure relationship with Aruka, born out of genuine connection and relatability, the list goes on. Naruto had half the time for their first episode than this show has, and yet they utilized every moment of it to truly define their main character and his relationships. I don't expect those levels of character development from a western show that released in the 2020s mind you, but man have I gotten whiplash going from one series to the next. If the show gave their characters proper treatment, focusing only on a few, and building them up to be engaging and easy to connect with, then this would have been a far better episode overall. They should have focused on setting up future developments instead of trying to bring up every character that exists in the universe within 44 minutes. It was overwhelming for not only the audience trying to latch onto them, but for the writers as well, shown with all the fluff and inconsistencies scattered throughout. At the end of the day, it felt like it had numerous writers who weren't on board with what each other wanted. Like everyone had their own ideas, and instead of coming to a consensus, they threw it all at the wall in order to determine and what sticked, leaving a mess in the process. The show has some showcased promise, with the Terrans being born on Earth being a good idea. Mandroid's willingness to use himself as a guinea pig when trying to gain power is interesting while leaving him unpredictable, but yet established to be intelligent. The connection between the Terrans and kids being physically manifested wasn't a bad idea, but having them immediately communicate feelings through a link that doesn't have any set limitations makes it feel like a plot convenience, while also also making it so they don't have to actually write a bond forming between the characters since it's already immediately established. It feels cheap right now but has the potential to be more in the future. Hardtop saying that he never willingly fight Megatron could leave room for interesting ways for conflict to be resolved with Decepticons based on their loyalty to Megatron. Whether they are still loyal, feeling betrayed, or somewhere in between, it can lead to interesting dynamics and strategies to employ depending on such. That's 
honestly all the good I have to say though. The foundation laid for the show by these first two episodes, or one episode, one special, whatever you want to call it, is rocky at best, but mostly non-existent. This should have been something to bring in new fans while having something for old fans as well, but barely comes together in the second half just to be a coherent narrative. It fails at introducing us to who the characters actually are, fails at establishing any meaningful stakes, fails at showcasing consequences for actions, and fails at hooking me by the end. Maybe it will improve, maybe it won't. But first impressions are important, and this just doesn't give out a good one. If you want to see more Earthspark coverage or something entirely different, then let me know in the comments below. But for more news, reviews, and whatever we choose, stay tuned to Nerdsfeed. Have a great day. Thank you.